And it's the first state championship in school history. It's the first state championship from a school in what the Northeast United States. What is talking about state champion, man? National championship. Go stand in the corner. This is the high. This this is college. You know how football. much you know how much I've okay. covered in the last month. You I know, know what's going on don't up here. Want to hear Too excuses. much. Don't want to hear excuses. Okay? Too much. That's a college national championship. The Orange Zone, sponsored by Billy Whitaker Cars and Trucks. What's up from the Sky Cam? Welcome into the award-winning Orange Zone podcast. A reminder, you can find every episode on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find every episode on our Orange Zone YouTube page. What's up if you're watching? New episodes released every Wednesday. We've also been having some overtime apps, so we invite you to like, comment, subscribe. Also, be sure to follow us on our Instagram and TikTok page for even more Orange Zone content. So on today's episode, we are going to be diving in to this coaching staff, the Syracuse University football coaching staff for 2024 under Fran Brown. Almost all of it is set in stone you know we still are waiting for some confirmations from the university but we have guys where they have the position in their bio some still to fill out but we know a lot so looking forward to that and then towards the end of the show we will be getting into our bowl game preview an update on garrett schrader the impact of kyle mccord we want to hear from james mungro about that and then of course producer brendan's final evil trivia Aww. the villain is moving on to baltimore so We'll be hearing from him here shortly. But I, don't, have, I don't want to get emotional. I know. you got to hold in those <laughs> tears, James. Early. It's too early for that. We got the Super Sorry. Bowl champ. We got the SU all-time great. We got James Mungro in the house. We have Samantha Crossin, Patriot League, all-second team, Colgate, lacrosse, I was like, goalie. you have to say something because every <laughs> okay, single week okay. you hype him up like Super Bowl champion. And then yeah, it's like, what Super like, Bowl what champion, I? I roll. You're, and Samantha Crossin. Samantha Crossin, Division One <laughs> all-Patriot League goalie. <laughs> We also have McAllister College's wide receiver <laughs> slash third string punt returner, uh, Brendan Fresh, Hodges. I, I want to see tape on that. You want to see tape on that? You're only going to see tape. You're going to see practice tape, and that's all you're going to get. Okay, so, uh, I just want to see the tape. Uh, to Tommy's heard this story before. The one punt I got a chance to return in the scrimmage my freshman year got blocked. So I never got a chance to return it. That's really – that's such a Brendan uh, thing to happen, though, man. It really is. It really is. Grandma is there. Everybody's all in the stands waiting to see him return it. Mm. Yeah, just walked off the field. <laughs> Next time, Grandma. Well, hey, we, we mentioned uh, people commenting on the shows. We've gotten so much more engagement. Just want to say shout out everyone for 500 subs. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're keeping we're, the grinding's going up. We were just at 250. And shout out Patrick Doran. Uh, dash T E one N O. My man left a comment on uh, Monday's show saying, "How about another podcast on new coaches that Fran Brown's bringing in?" And okay. he he read our minds. And so, thank you, Patrick. We appreciate it. This one's for you, my guy. Let's get into this coaching staff and let's start with the OC in DC. The OC not yet confirmed, but this man has been tweeting about SU commits. He looks to be the guy. It's Jeff Nixon, the New York Giants running backs coach. Uh, we have reports from ESPN and 24-7 Sports indicating back in the beginning of the month that Nixon is the next target. So, um, you know, Brian Dable, the head coach, was asked about it. He gave him his blessing, you know, a big opportunity for him. So here's some background on Nixon. Former Penn State Nittany Lion, Pennsylvania native. Shout out me and James. Okay. He began his coaching career as a grad assistant in Happy Valley. Since then, he's both coached both in college and the NFL. Most notably, this is the big one right here, at Baylor during Matt, Yule, Matt Rule's tenure, Fran Brown and Elijah Robinson were also on that staff in 2017. So, again, he's been putting out tweets and tweeting out about Kyle McCord, Jackson Meeks, James Hurd. So he seems to be very much involved in Syracuse. Sam, you got some stats for us? Because let's talk about what he has actually done. Back in 2019, Nixon led a Baylor offense that was averaging 431 yards per game, ranked 17th in the nation with 35 points per game. 2018, a similar story here, ranking 22nd in the nation in total offense averaging 459 yards per game including 290 passing yards a game but you mentioned it the thing that I think is sticking out to me beyond the stats beyond what Nixon is able to do is the fact that he's played with these other coaches already Fran Brown appreciates and values the importance of connections and it's pretty cool to me that all three of these guys for one year in 2017 were on the same staff I don't know if you guys noticed this. Coaching's a big carousel. 
I mean, it, there's <laughs> so, so much overlap um, with different coaches and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of these guys have probably worked with, I mean, with the overlap and there's, you know, after you're talking to one guy and to another guy on, on the staff, you know, the overlap could be like 500 different coaches right. that I want to know, you know, and, uh, and that's a good good thing about coaching. But the, the, you know, not, another nice thing is that this young man here, uh, you know, the experience he has, it's gonna be very. It means it's gonna be just nothing but down much far, you know, for the team. So it's gonna be great to, to have him there. And he's working with Saquon Barkley. That's uh, exactly. pretty cool. E exactly. You get to say that. So, recruits, I mean, but having so, an NFL experience, what do you think? As a as a college player, having a guy come in that's working with a star like that. Would that have, would that be attractive to you? Do you think that really plays a role in not just like attraction, but also development? It, it does because he knows exactly. You know, he's been in that position, um, and you know that's one of the biggest things I, I get you know upset about with different things of you know guys chop blocking and stuff like that as a running back. And it's kind of like, okay, well, listen, if you're going to make it in the league, you have to stand up and block sometimes. And if you can't do that in college, you're not going to do it professionally. So he knows exactly how the game is, is going to be played at the next level. So he can, you know, not teach the guys, but advise, I mean, advise them and teach them now and, and not wait to, you know, going through um, your, senior, your senior year and you're, you're, you know, you're trying to learn that technique now. So it'll be taught in the very beginning. And that's what I like about it. Here's sure. a question I have, though. Yeah. Why do you think that Jeff Nixon, who is currently with the New York Giants, would want to come to Syracuse? I think because he's a positions coach and – I, I don't know fully about how the money situation works for assistant coaches in the NFL, but I think in terms of a you know jump opportunity, being a coordinator at a Power 5 school is pretty big. Also, he could be making more money. I mean, from what we're seeing, they, they, get, they get some good dough. But it's also, <laughs> it, Fran, if Fran Brown's his guy, man, and you want to be a part of something special, I think that I'm sure has something. To yeah, do. I mean, it's all different. You know, Pennsylvania guy. Obviously, he's in you know uh, New York now, yeah. but um, still close to home still, mm -hmm. and be able to see his family, and you know, still have that, like you said, like the you know having Fran around and right. worked with Fran previously. Um, but yeah, you know, jumping back and forth, I, I think the opportunity is good for him. Like you said, you know, Power Five school, being a coordinator. Um, yeah, you know, he's playing professional. You know, he's there professional coaching, but you know, it, it's just. Maybe you want to, you know, rewrite the record books. Right. And be, 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 be a part of something very special that I think is going to happen this year. And, and to know, again, this is, that's, this is one that has not been confirmed, but everything we're seeing, it feels like <laughs> Nixon's going to be the guy next year. Before I forget, you mentioned being able to block as a running back and how important that is when the NFL scouts are looking at these guys. Is there anyone that stuck out to you that you were in charge of as an assignment on a play? Like, was Ray Lewis ever coming into your gap or anything? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I've, had, I've had blocks against some guys, different different guys. Any uh, that stick out that you were like? I, I knocked Ray down before. Yeah? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I mean it, it happens. I mean, it's all about leverage, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not being scared and just doing your job. Um, one of my favorite blocks is, you know, I was blocking Dion. Um on it was uh, on a goal line actually, and I had to actually chop him, and and that's the way the play is designed to chop block the yeah. guy to get him on the ground. But I just I couldn't do it. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't chop him. I couldn't chop him. It was like kind of like a half. It, it was kind of ugly, but I got in his way, and I knew he wasn't going to run me over or anything like that. But, yeah, uh, we scored. Uh huh. Did my assignment. Got my job done. All right. He's quick as they say. Uh, this was you know later in his career. So, yeah. but he still was prime time. You know, <laughs> who scored? Was still prime. Who scored on that play? Um, just the fact that you know you scored on that drive is like well, I, know, I, I, like I, I, NFL I, I, players I are nuts like him. that. I had to block him. That's what I mean. But we, we did score. But just like the fact that you know that yeah. you scored on that yeah. drive is yeah. so I don't know how football players do that. It's pretty amazing. But let's move on. D coordinator. This one is confirmed, and this one, I mean, <laughs> this one was just about as new as Fran Brown getting the job as this news came out pretty much right behind it. And that is Elijah Robinson. Former uh, co-D coordinator and assistant coach at Texas A&M, the first hire made by Fran Brown. He is a native of Camden, New Jersey. They grew up together. Robinson was basically like that older brother to, to Brown that he very much looked up to him, um, known as one of the nation's most prolific recruiters. Like, if you look at the list over the past few years, it's Fran Brown, 
or it's Elijah Robinson mm-hmm. right up there at the top. So he was named uh, 24-7 Sports Top Recruiter of 2022, thanks in part to helping the Aggies land the nation's best recruiting class. He worked with Fran Brown at Temple and Baylor. So they were with each other for uh, a while. You know, Nixon was a little bit shorter, but he and Brown of Brown and, and Robinson, you know, they – they were at the hip for many years, and he also played D tackle at Penn State. Um, I see a quote in a stat here. What do you like? Because the reason I put this quote in is because I had even been watching Fran Brown on the ACC network, and he was talking about how he was nervous at first. He wasn't sure whether or not this was going to go through, but he was so excited once it did. And he, he said, I think we have the best defensive coordinator in the country. As you mentioned, someone I grew up with, someone I look up to. I've seen how good of a coach he is. He can recruit, he can coach, he's a great communicator, and he's amazing with the X's and O's. But this part to me, the most important, he says the kids are going to love him. And again, that's what you see is the consistent thread with Fran Brown truly wanting people who are good guys, good husbands, good fathers, good people. He says these are all the things that make a great coach. And Robinson is one of the guys who represents all of those to him. Big time. And and Brown mentioned he's like, we're not going to have this guy for long. Like he yeah. is, he is so close to his own head coaching spot, um, and you mentioned how quickly things move. Do you think, no matter what, going after the best guy, even if it is in the short term, is the best is the best decision in these type of positions? I, I think so because yeah. what I like about him, uh, Texas A and M. They're gonna have some big boys. He's been around some <laughs> yeah. big boys, you know, yeah. some big boys. When I say Corn big fed. strong boys, real, you know. Go getters. Yeah. That's what I call go getters. And he's gonna bring that to the table to mm-hmm. Syracuse that we haven't had in a long time. Right. Um and the size down there. I mean, look at Texas guys and look at our guys. Yeah. You know, it's, it's completely different. Speed wise, everything. So yeah. I'm really happy to bring that type of positive to the defense and to this the offense, the culture of Syracuse, bring that in. You know, starting to rebuilding and this is this is the beginning of it. Right. And I, the, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't know if you guys are going to know what I'm talking about, but did you guys see that picture on Twitter of that high school yes. Texas football player? Yes. <laughs> it, it was hilarious. <laughs> Do we. Brendan, can you explain it? Brendan, <laughs> there is a, like. I'll pull a, it up. And Brendan, let's, um, for the viewers on YouTube, we'll try to blow this up full yes. screen for you. I, I really think it's it's worthy to have this I'm here. Pretty can sure find Sam, it for James and I? This is like a, there is a player who is 6'2", 215 in this picture but then the offensive lineman blocking him is dwarfing him basically mm. like he's like sick looks like he's seven feet tall compared to this kid and he's an offensive lineman from DeSoto High School in Texas I'm pretty sure I've seen this picture a ton of times it's always the Texas kid yeah man. dude like it's it's just like <laughs> I don't know what it is they're just I mean, it, I, mean, I, mean this I mean this is it it's a culture this right? is the one <laughs> oh <laughs> where's he committed <laughs> When you said when you said Texas has some big boys, yeah. I thought that, of that, that guy. That's unfair. <laughs> it's not right. That's not that's not fair. It's not but, right. But uh, in a, in a, in, but in, in a way, number eleven. I don't know what the hell was he trying to do to like get through him. Like yeah. you again, gotta, you, I mentioned, mentioned your you mentioned speed being or, fearless. I mean, you mentioned being fearless. <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. imagine how that's, that's dumb. A, that's an offensive <laughs> line. Be brave. Be brave, dude. But no, like there's the picture. One of the captions was. The smaller kid is like six two two fifteen. That's the crazy part. Yeah, I'm just like I, I just that's that's yeah yeah. If you're if you're anyway. listening, wow. Well, if Sam, go to Sam's Twitter. She'll she'll repost it. Something like that. That is um, amazing. But no, but he's gonna bring that type of culture to like you know hard nosed tough um, go getters and yeah. and that's that's what I like. I mean right. that's what I like. I, I like people out there that's very hungry and and I mean I I, I feel like Syracuse is hungry. But they just don't have the right ingredients. Right. Mm. Really right. fast. Yeah. If you had to guess the big guy, how tall he is and how much he weighs, I have it now. He's what probably, would you guess? About, uh, I was going to say 6'8". Six, 6'8", eight. Six, eight, he's about 360. Yeah. That's, That's pretty good. Yeah. 368. 6'7", uh, 380. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> big boy, man. But see, okay, even, anyway. even, even with that size, though, okay, you know, in, in high school, you can get away with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah, obviously, he'll have uh, some scholarships offers and stuff like that. But, again, you got to have heart. You got to have You have to have heart. And, you know, just because he's that big, he has to have, you know, feet. Ability right. to move. Ability to move. Yeah, athleticism. Um, they're going to have – you know, they'll teach him. Um, 
because there's other guys that size too as well. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but he has a hell of a start on <laughs> right. I'm on to, the process. I'm to imagine like how <laughs> agile can you be at 380 pounds? But I've seen some of the big boys moving. Yeah. I'm like, wow, you know. And, yeah. and and you know another thing too as well. Okay, yeah, that that kid's you know nice size and he's down in Texas, <laughs> uh, you know, in the heat. So you bring you know bring a guy up up here to up north. <laughs> what are you laughing about? It's just so funny. I can't get over that picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, like he's a nice size. I'm like he's a nice size. <laughs> anyway. Um, but you know he comes comes up north and it's you know colder, right? You know it's colder and he's not outside m much and all that type of stuff. That means you're gonna gain more weight, get more lazier. So there's a lot a lot of stuff involved in the whole big picture. But I mean, like I said, the kid has uh, some good genetics so far. Oh, Lyman, don't wear <laughs> sleeves. So um, yeah, who knows? Did we say where he's committed? I don't know. No, I said he's a three-star star recruit. Sarah, I was gonna say Sarah I don't even know if he's. Yeah, you know what? Let's just for the sake of things, <laughs> let's just say who, hopefully he ends up there. So that makes it all Kirk worth Robinson's it. Robinson's bringing him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, working on the D line with Robinson is going to be Nick Williams, and he'll be the defensive ends coach, not D line coach. I made that mistake in the past. He will be specifically D ends, which is interesting. So Williams is he's the biggest of the position coaches to me on this list right now, and it's because he, like Brown and Robinson, is the third head on the three headed monster of recruiting. With this group. So he comes over from Colorado under Dion. It was his first coaching job. His connections to the Q staff come from being at Texas A&M with Elijah Robinson in 21 and 22 as a defensive analyst. He started his coaching career as a grad assistant with Georgia. And he played at Georgia, then transferred to North Alabama. Some stints in the CFL and arena. He's from uh, Bainbridge, Georgia. And the thing with Nick Williams that he you you see on social media why he has that connection like he's having fun with these kids when they were in the recruiting at the dome i saw him doing like you know pretend dunks with them and you could just you can feel his energy and you can feel from being a younger guy his connection i, I was going to say that I, I was just going to say yep. by having the younger these younger coaches connect with the players understand the players a little bit more right and you know it, it's it's nothing like you know getting along with the coach that's mm -hmm. half the battle right there and uh, believe in their coaches, so that's 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 tremendous right there. And it comes with some authenticity. And you've been saying that since day one that that the best coaches are the ones who you believe in the most and have the best relationships with. And I am starting to realize that that is the theme across all of the best recruiters as well. Right. All of these guys who are amazing recruiters, really, they say. I don't have any kind of sales pitch. I tell the truth. They're great people, and I feel like great people draw in great people. And, and exactly, when you have that rec that that recruiter that comes into your house and says, "Listen, you're going to be able to turn this program around. You're going to be able to do this and do that. You're going to come as as a freshman and going to start for us, uh, and and you know hype you all up." And that's not the, that's not the case. That's the, that's the recruiter that's going to you know, and I can name some names, but I'm not going to do that. That is just a bunch, bunch of BS. You mm -hmm. know, when you have a coach that says, "Listen, you can get a great, great education." And on top of that, you'll be able to compete for a starting job. That's all you want to hear at the end of the day. That's the person who's telling the truth. The person who's telling you all the things you're going to get, like, that's BS. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to earn and get that respect already. And there's other players on the team. So you're telling them I'm just going to walk in and be a starter, a starter automatically? No, that's not the case at all, sir. You know, I I'm not, not dumb. There's other guys there. <laughs> right. And honestly, I wouldn't even want that. I exactly. wouldn't even want somebody who comes in and says, you are going to have the starting job. I want somebody who will look me in the eyes in front of my parents and say, you have to earn this. This is something that you are going to have to do for yourself, but I can promise you exactly what you said, great education, and you will have a chance. You'll work hard every day. You'll come out of this program a better person. What else can you really promise besides that, you know? Exactly. And that's, you know, that, and now these days with, <clears throat> what players say, that's being real. You know, I want to be with someone who's real. That's someone that's not fake. Mm-hmm. Big time. Next up is co-DC in linebackers. That is Robert Wright out of the University of Buffalo, where he comes over as being their DC. So that's our first true New York connection of these new guys. Someone that's not just New York, but he's upstate. And I think that's big. Um, he's had time at UCF. He was with Iowa State. And there you go. Spent two years at Texas A&M as a defensive grad assistant. So overlap you just know right he there. has some overlap, overlap with Elijah Robinson. <laughs> was also at uh, Illinois, Miami. Played DB at Miami for a year. Hometown St. Louis, Missouri, just like Brendan. And uh, Brendan, I, I'm going to have you do the honors. Do you want Nunzio or do you want one of these guys on the back page here? Uh... Yeah, I'll do Nunzio. Let's do Nunzio. Okay, bring us in. Everyone loves Nunzio, right? 
Yeah. It, we're really big into Italians here in New York now. You got DeVito, you got IDVO, you got Nunzio. It's like, it, what don't you like, right? Uh, tight ends coach last year. Oh, I guess this year, technically still, and the interim head coach right. uh, going into the Boca Raton Bowl, which uh, I believe we'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, played a part in Dan Villari's recruiting. That was pretty good as far as this year is gone. I think we can mm-hmm. all agree. Uh, Villari, a fan favorite of this show. And uh, it has been in the Northeast really his entire life, has brothers in coaching too. I mean, what don't, what don't you like about this guy, right? He just seems like the ultimate, just like Northeastern guy, and he's going to be really helpful in recruiting the Northeast, which was already Fran Brown's specialty, but it's another guy with ties there that's going to keep. Quick note: I don't know if he was exactly a part of his recruiting, but he's been a part of his development because I think oh, Valari enough, was yeah. here actually a year early. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, but ba- you know, misread that. He's he's a guy where I wasn't. I knew that there'd be a few that stay on staff, right? I think you gotta kind of have some people that are in the know of. The team members that the are there currently. The team members that are there currently. Yes. What's going right? What what could you tell wasn't going right? <laughs> yes. And I think that's really important, and it feels like Nuns is a good guy to be a part of that crew, I, especially considering that they were together at Rutgers. I do think it's interesting. This is going to be a different type of quarterback coming in, and we'll get to this later, too, with Kyle McCord versus what they've had recently. It's going to be a different challenge for Nunzio than it has been in the past with a guy like Jason Beck and uh, previous quarterback coaches. But we'll get to that later. Okay. Next up. Offensive line, Dale Williams. He comes as being a Louisville senior quality control analyst. And just that right there, Cards had a great year, man. Yeah. Cards mm-hmm. had a great year. And you got to imagine that this guy is a big part of it, considering he's coming over after serving as the offensive line coach at Purdue um, from 2017 to 22. And this O line, you know, the pieces to that puzzle are what we're still waiting on. Right in the re- in the recruiting world right now, and we mentioned that in our episode about the commits is is we're still waiting on kind of who's going to fill these roles. You have a few guys that I'm expecting are probably coming back, still have some time in there. You know, Enrique Cruz, John Ray Reed, but you know, Chris Bleich, dudes like that, they're going to be moving on. And this guy Dale Williams' job of not just it, it it's important because as we all know, receivers, running back, quarterback, they can all be great. Yeah. But if that O-line's not great, <laughs> things just yes. can't happen. Absolutely I mean, right. we even talked about that yesterday when we were looking at our list of recruits. Mm-hmm. You know, what's going to happen and what's on this list so far. And the one thing that we realized that there's not a whole lot of recruits yet for is the O-line. Right. And it's something that even this year I really felt Syracuse struggle with. It's an area that needs to improve. So I think that out of a lot of the people who we've listed so far, I think Dale Williams is going to have a very big role here. That's a make or break position for me. And before we continue further on this list, I just want to ask you, Mungro, like a few weeks ago, you know, prior to Dino Babers being fired, the things that we were talking about, would you ever have thought that a few weeks from now we'd be in the position we are now where Syracuse (coughs) is propelled back into the national conversation even? Honestly, I, I thought it would take a little bit longer. And I thought they would probably hold their feet and stumble around and have the you know people hired before, and then now we're just getting we're picking at the bottom of the barrel. Um, so I'm really thrilled and happy that uh, John Wildhack you know pulled the string early and um, you know got the show on the road and, and not waiting, not progressing. I mean they're moving forward, and um, you know we got a guy everyone's happy about. Like you said, we're back in the national talk again uh, with all different reasons, positive, not negative. Um, and so we're heading in the right direction, and I'm, I'm very happy that we, we pulled the string early and got, got the ball rolling. What are the group chats with, with the former players? It, it, like, is, is there a different energy in those than you felt in years? Oh, of course. The energy, the level of energy is back to what it used to be, you know what I mean, of knowing that uh, potentially we could have a, a university that could represent uh, – the elder, elderly football players, former <laughs> players, in a positive way, and not look down like, "Wow, are you sh- are you- not again!" Like I'm sick of saying that. <laughs> right. Um, so I mean, obviously the buzz is very positive. You know, we're the Syracuse Nation of alumni, and um, you know we're looking forward for this guy. You know, uh, do some big things with this coaching staff. Big time. I'm going to rattle off the next three here, and I'm going to get your guys' thoughts on maybe anything that sticks out to you. So wide receivers passing game coordinator will be Ross Douglas. Again, a lot of these things are unconfirmed by the school, but they're in the bios. We have every reason to believe that these are going to be the next guys. He began his coaching career at his alma mater, Rutgers, Jersey Connection, in the recruiting department before becoming a grad assistant on defense. Stayed until 2020, went to Richmond as a cornerbacks coach before landing in the NFL as a Patriots receiver coach. So 
So he played DB <clears throat> and LB at uh, Michigan 2013-2015 and then finished up at Rutgers. So, again, you do the math on that. That's another young guy. Um, so hometown of Ohio. Assistant wide receivers coach Devin Red. This one was announced very early. Um, coach at the collegiate high school level. Only coordinator job coming at the high school level. But Coach Kareem Hunt, when he was at Toledo, um, I saw Kareem Hunt when he was at Toledo. It was, it was actually Kareem's Hunt Toledo team that beat Fran Brown and Elijah Robinson's Temple team in the 2015 Boca Raton Bowl. Okay. How about that? <laughs> Small world. Um, and then played DB at Southwest. Southwest Baptist, hometown Baltimore. Tight ends coach Mike Johnson. So he's another guy like Nunzio that is going to be staying on but moving in a new position. Johnson slides over from receivers coach to tight ends. As we know, Coach Nunz was tight ends, now with quarterback. So prior to SU, this is a guy that comes in with, he was everywhere, um, was at FAU. He also had stops at Mississippi State, Oregon, UCLA, the Niners, Ravens, Falcons, Chargers, Oregon State. It's another guy with some NFL connections. As a player, he was with Arizona State in Akron. He was a part of NFL Europe. What an era. I, I, what an era I, I for love, NFL I Europe. love the, the diversity of all the coaches for all the yeah. different things they've done. So, I mean, like, again, they're going to bring all this knowledge to Syracuse and, you know, bring it to a, a program that's been struggling and, it's going to make a difference. I mean, because these guys are winners. These guys are winners. These guys want to, the guys want to win. Not saying other staff they want to win, but they just didn't know how to win. Um, and they couldn't get the puzzle together. So, <laughs> I mean, Fran, he's doing his thing. He's doing his thing. Coaching piece and puzzles. What sticks I, out to you? I mean, first of all, Ross Douglas is the second guy who we're naming who is coming directly from the NFL. Honestly, I think as a recruit – if I was able to say, hey, I have two guys on my coaching staff who just came from the NFL, that would, that would be a cool, unique, interesting, you know, that would be a draw <clears throat> for me. Not to mention, obviously, all of the experience that they do bring having, played at a high, having coached at a higher level. Um, but back to the fact that a lot of these guys are young, let's just forget about for a second the fact that I do think that they connect better. I also just think that you're just getting more out of a guy who's 40 than 60. Like, I just feel like they can work harder, even just from an energetic standpoint, Fran Brown sleeping four hours a night. Like, I just feel like having guys who are in their, in their 40s or 50s or even 30s, you know, that, that's a really cool, unique part of this coaching staff. And it makes me think, okay, there's going to be some longevity here in certain parts of it. We'll say this. Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you got to be rolling. I mean, I, I like Fran. <laughs> Fran's doing good. I mean, he's doing great with the staff. So you're telling me he only sleeps four hours a night? That's what he said. Okay. Now. He told us that directly. Okay. You know, you don't. He's exaggerating a little bit, you know. I don't think I, don't know. I do. I'm telling you, I know people you, like that. I do four not think hours. he's shout out he Wayne told, Mahar. Shout out my man Wayne. Wayne used to sleep four hours a night. I don't it's, think he's exaggerating a bit. He told me he goes to bed around one. He wakes up around four forty-five. James, I is do not like think that is an exaggeration. Right what do you say? He gets in a workout. <laughs> he said. So his he, wife said, he, said he said I get up at four forty-five and I get in a small workout so that my wife stays interested in me and then I go to work. <laughs> okay, I can dig that. I can dig it. I can dig it. I can dig it. <laughs> That's such a funny line. But to go with the, <laughs> we'll have to ask again and circle back around to it. Yeah, I'm well. telling you though. But not to you know not to diss not to diss the six year olds of the world. I know some very fresh. You know, fire on the mind individuals that are in their 60s and 70s. Totally. Sam. And one of them is special teams coordinator Bob Legashevsky because he's sticking around oh and he's got 40 <laughs> years of coaching experience. So, 40 years so, of coaching experience at the, the, the age Samantha of what a, what a segue. So, let's, so, yeah. let's have some there. So, what do you, how you feel about this one? Me? Yeah. Well, what, is, what, is, what is this 60 year old coach let's girl about the table? Bob. Everybody back <laughs> off. Bob Legashevsky on the off chance you are listening to the Orange Zone Bob's podcast. A Bob's a man. You are literally one of the people who I was the most excited to talk about. Oh, I, no. I, I know, I know, I know. Everybody. Oh, shoot. Yeah, okay. Wow. I'm not okay. kidding. Okay. I even said before the, the show. <laughs> even he's because, laughing. Ready? Yeah. Even he's laughing. Uh, got myself too Go ahead. Today. Let it rip on Bob. Listen, I know what I said. Mm -hmm. 40 years experience Bob has. Yeah. And I'm not going to take back what I said, but to me, Bob is the, is the wise old owl. Okay. He's the person who has. So I was six years old when Bob was coaching. Just to let you know. I was yeah. si now. You, you guys called me old before. I was six years old when Bob started his coaching career. Tr trending theme with you. Were you calling James old? Did I it call was you a while old? back. I don't yeah. want to get into that. You know, but all right, we don't. We don't have to get into <clears> all yeah. that. Forty years though. I was six years old, and he was, you know, started his coaching career. Let me just just give Bob <laughs> Ligachewski his flowers Let's for a minute. It. The fact that before joining Syracuse, he had already spent nearly 40 years in coaching, including 12 seasons in the NFL, 
is astounding. He won a Super Bowl as the Pittsburgh Steelers special teams coordinator in 2008. Uh, I'm bringing, oh, okay, 2008. Yeah. Okay. 2008. And, and no, listen, he's, he's, he's done a great job here, and I think he will continue to do a great job. If you are going to have a couple of guys who you retain from the old coaching staff, it feels like Bob Ligashevsky is the right guy to do that with because who has really seen more, not just in Syracuse, but across all of football than him? I feel like he would have a unique perspective that I'd want to hear from. I also think and that's on yeah. old people. Thank I also you. think it's interesting that, you know, the one thing that Mike Johnson um, and Nunzio and – Bob Ligashevsky have in common is that they're all relatively new with the program, right? You know, they weren't a part of the Babers era and more. Yeah. And that to me that's, is that's, that's different too as well. He, I think he that's wasn't, interesting. He wasn't part of the, like you said, the, the, the circle of right. coaches with Babers. He's an outsider from Babers circle. Exactly. And uh, played DB at Indiana University of PA. PA? So shout out to PSAC, PA. man, best D2 conference in the country. And I will, I will, Hold true to that. So let's flip over and go back to the front page here. We're talking Boca Raton. We're talking Kyle McCord. And, and let's do that. Let's do, let's do Kyle immediately. So Kyle McCord transfers over from Ohio State. He's coming to Syracuse. Like this was the name when it was first taught us out there where I was upstairs in our newsroom meeting being like, okay, simmer down. Yeah, you know, I don't want people getting too excited. My, my, my this buddy is reality, call, bro. My buddy calls me and he says, hey, do you see what just happened? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, Kyle's coming. I'm like, who? Is Ohio State quarterback is coming to Syracuse. I said, man, why do you keep messing with me? Yeah. And he's an Italian kid, and I think he's a big Danny. Um, he's a big Advito fan. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I didn't know he was going to say it. SBS. He's not a, he's not a yeah. uh, Danny's fan. But uh, either way, he says that to me. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. So I immediately go to ESPN to see. And I'm like, holy smokes. Holy smokes. We went from a 60 to below average, like I think about 60 average quarterback, that's what uh, Schrader was, to an 80. Just use the math Use the math as grades-wise. So you're dealing with someone that's damn near fell on it. I, I'm going to defend Schrader. I'm going to defend Schrader. I think it's more of a big picture thing. I okay. think to me, to me it's a, you know, because <clears throat> Schrader, and we'll, we'll get into him in a second, I mean, well, I, either no, way, I'd, I'd rather go with an 80 than a 60. 100%. I, I, that's what I got to say. But it's, it, to me, this is, this is past trader. This is, this is going back the last 10, 20 years where, to me, I mean, the, the, level, of the, the, the level of this quarterback, like, mm-hmm. like where he is in, in, the, in the, what he's been accomplishing, I mean, it's, it's been 20 years. I, it's I, crazy to say. I, I think what's going to happen is this. I think – what happened with the quarterback position here at Syracuse is obviously the McNabb was very, very special. I mean, it was something unbelievable special. That's, yeah. you know, and it's hard 20, to live up to that yeah, afterwards, that's 25 right? 25 years ago, you yeah. know, and I guess <laughs> unbelievable for, for me to say that. And then the routine got, got into, okay, we can go to quarterbacks and come to Syracuse and be athletic. And, you know, they're going to depend on the athleticism. And it's not so much of just throwing the ball all the time. So you had that option of being a, uh, a subpar quarterback that could throw the ball, but also knew that he could run. Right. So that's why the different quarterbacks have been coming to Syracuse. They're running quarterbacks that are athletic. Dungy, Schrader. I mean, these guys are athletic. They just can't throw the ball very accurate or, or, or you know. Um, so I think, you know, that's the, the, the players that are coming to Syracuse. That's what they see from Syracuse. We can go to this, we, as a quarterback, we can go to Syracuse and not be a good, good thrower or be half-decent throwing and be all right. Now I feel like the focus point is going to be a lot different. They're going to have quarterbacks that come into Syracuse that could throw the ball and also run. So it's not that, you know, we're not going to focus more on the running part. We're going to find a quarterback that actually throw the ball. And then when it's time to run, then you run the ball. But it's not going to be run first and then throw second. And he's not that QB at all. Yes. And that's what fans will be needing to get used to because, I mean, the, the Dungy DeVito Schrader train, like that is a, those are run heavy dudes. Yes. This guy is what you consider a game manager. He's going to be staying in the pocket. And when you're at the, the elite levels, right, that was some of the problems that you know, certain fans have with McCord at Ohio State is he, is he wasn't going to do stuff beyond that. I'm like, beyond what? <laughs> I'm like, beyond what? This he's 11-1. Man, he's 11 and one. Like, what he's 11-1, I mean, which is when we mentioned. And there's still a lot of people chirping. <laughs> yeah, chirping. And that's part of the reason he came here. And the O-line is going to be very important, though, because that is one thing, is that, that he didn't really have to deal with pressure. Yes. With the Buckeye, with those, with those big boys <laughs> on that line. So, so providing him protection is 
integral in this offseason here. But I think that he truly feels that he will get that. I don't think that he would have committed to come to Syracuse. That's a great point. Unless he felt confident that Fran Brown was going to have those pieces that he was going to be able to have to surround him. And McCord had said that. He said, I truly wanted to go to a program where I felt that I could win right away because he only has one year left of eligibility. And I thought Syracuse is a place where that could happen. He has the belief. The Fran Brown effect, baby. And outside of football, you know, we did see some people – affiliated with SU, maybe making some mentions that that he has interest in Newhouse, which we know to be one of the best communication schools in the country. So if that's a factor in, um, you got to imagine that plays a part in why someone like that comes to Syracuse that maybe sees himself in a career of broadcasting or media or whatever. So honestly, shout out SU for that regard. Yeah, that's cool. and, that's, and that's, you know, very smart. You know, as a young man, you could just tell that he's a very smart intellectual person by – you know, he's preparing. He's, he's, thinking he's, ahead. he's thinking ahead, not thinking that, you know, hopefully he'll have a career and most likely he'll have a career at the next level. But if he doesn't, guess what? He has something to, you know, to back up on and the best place to be is Syracuse. I Look mean, at this guy right here, man. <laughs> listen, the best place to be is Syracuse for that. And I mean, of course, I mean, I, I feel like I'm biased, but that's a great career. Why not at least have <laughs> have something to set yourself up for some kind of a backup plan? Mm-hmm. And I almost feel even like that's insulting to say that that new house of broadcasting is a backup plan because even that, you know. Um, so well, so no, shout no, out. You can say it how it is. I, like, yeah, is, I mean, when you're, when you're a quarterback real. at it's the highest ba- level, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's a backup right, plan. Like yeah. you, you see all the commentators now, they're, I mean, they're ex, ex players. Let's be honest. A lot of a lot of quarterbacks. Guess who wanted to be a pro athlete? This guy. Who you? Guess who didn't end up being a pro athlete? This guy. Figure that one out pretty quickly. I, I, I what was it? What was the moment you knew? Oh, I'm not going to be a. Pro I athlete. actually, I actually can tell this right now. I have two of them. <laughs> Ironically, the first one that I said, okay, I really need to start thinking this through, is I was in a U13 game playing AAU in Philly. It's going up against Camden. I was playing with the PA Ooh, Renegades. Camden. And um and Coach Brown, a hometown. kid. I was covering a kid on a fast break, and he slammed. We were 12 or 13. And he slammed. And I said, okay. That, that's going to the next level. And then it was two years later, and it was uh, this kid, Nick Lindner, uh, who you can look him up. He ended up helping taking them to March Madness when he was playing with uh, Lafayette down in PA. He was at Germantown Academy for a bit. Um, but he crossed me over so hard in tryouts that like I was, I was still <laughs> facing this way, and he was mm. putting the ball in the basket. And I said, well, <laughs> let's, let's broadcasting sounds well, cool. Do, do you know what I think? I think you're an all-pro broadcaster. Wow. That's that just so cute. Look, this is, that's just so cute. Oh, Hit the cute auto button. Hey, let me ask you a question, though. Yeah. Let's ask Brandon Hodges. Yeah. What did you want to be, Brandon, if you're a professional yeah. athlete? What, What's like, up, Brandon? When, when did you know that you weren't going to be a professional athlete, Brandon? Um, like when I was in high school and started loving play-by-play. Oh, was that uh-huh. late? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, here's the thing. Like, I was one of those kids that was like, let me, I want to work in movies. That's good. That, that, was, that was my first thing. Okay. And so, like, okay. like did, did that, and then it was like uh, creative writing. That kind of ties into it. And then it was like, oh, let's call Jamie. Veterinarian? You want to be a No, vet no. It was never anything like that. <laughs> okay. Astronaut. <laughs> no, like, it, it was a pretty, like, early on where I was like, yeah, probably not that. Like, I can say that all I want, but let's be real. Like, let's think of something a little more reasonable. It was like, Film writing, and then I got into play-by-play in like my junior year of high school, calling JV basketball, and then I was like, "Hey, let's go find a place where I can play football, get a great education, and uh, do play-by-play on the side." And found it. Quick opposite question before we keep moving to the bowl: When did you know that you were like, "I, I can go pro"? When did you have that moment? Um, first year I ever played football, I was eight years old. I was offensive guard. The second year I was a running back and stayed a running back ever since. Um, I would say what I, what I honestly feel that I could, you know, I felt like I had an opportunity to do it um, when I was younger, you know, in high school, like, ah, you know, I can go up. You, you got to have your steps. You got yeah. you have to go to college first, you know. And in high school, I was real good, whatever like that, came to college. And then once I got to college, the reality is that staying healthy, that's like a big thing. Um, and pretty much when I was in college, I said, I could play professional, but the harder thing is to stay healthy. Right. That's because, I, I mean, I saw people dropping. You know, seniors, juniors. That you knew guys that probably would have gone. <laughs> yeah, that were ahead of me when I was just a freshman. I mean, I'm mean, going to forget a few guys just, like, honestly calling them, you know, just crying and saying they can't play no more because of injury, you know, and you're one injury away from that. So, yeah. uh, for me, after seeing that, I really just said to myself, I just want to get my foot in the door and just play this a little bit. If I just get an opportunity, just give me an opportunity and I can show my skills. Yeah. And that's pretty much how, how it was. But I, I honestly felt that. 
I, I could play. Once I got there, it was like, oh, I could definitely play. I could definitely play with these guys like that. But it's a learning curve. It's, it's a big learning curve. Yeah. Everything is faster and it's, you know, but our coach, Coach Dungey, was a great guy. We had roles and you learned your role and you became good at your role. And that's what I did. It's funny seeing comments of people, you know, that kind of come across our our page and people that are PA people that knew you from Stroudsburg. And it's, <laughs> it's awesome when people see the comments like that. It's just like the most fundamentally sound running back I've ever seen. So smooth with it. East Stroudsburg's James Mungro. I love it, man. It's great. Uh, PA player of the year, by the way. How about that? One or two years, I think. I was the big school player of the year. Yeah. Uh, junior. My junior seven. year. And then uh, Ar- uh, LeVar Arnton got it uh, my senior year. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I got, I, I got it as a junior, and then you know it was fun though. You so know, dope. Um, Boca Bowl, big, big thirty three, uh, big thirty three game, big thirty three game. You know, huge, huge. MVP PA of the, Ohio, M- MVP of that game. You know? Yeah, and we had some big studs there. Lavar Anton was there too. I got MVP. Love that. You know, of, of that game. So I've been MVP a lot of big time bowl games and yeah. big games. Right there. But, 2001. But let's talk about other people. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about other people. <laughs> Boca Bowl, Syracuse, USF, Thursday night, 8 o'clock. Um, you know, no Garrett Trader. So it turns out that we just learned yesterday that he actually had a tear in his shoulder in the first game against Virginia Tech. If you watch the replay, he tried to kind of flip the ball out as he was getting tackled, and you can see where the tear happened. So, you know, did Garrett have the numbers every game? No. Did he have some really high, high moments? Beginning of this season, yes. Whereas passes dead on accurate, yes. Did that completely dissipate as the season went on at certain moments? Yes. Did he recover again in the final game of the season to help his team go to a bowl game? Yes. And so for he's him, he's a tough to, kid. For him, he, and that is that he's is tough, he's a tough kid. He's a his tough legacy kid. leaving is that what's going to stand out to you guys? For myself, yes. I, yeah, I, he, he's a tough kid. I, I mean. He's not going to give up. He's a very tough kid, athletic. You saw him do the backflip at Yankee Stadium. Yeah. I mean, he's a very tough kid. Um, I wish him the best moving forward. Uh, I, I think he's going to try to play, you know, professional. I don't think he's a professional quarterback. I mean, that's just one thing I don't think he is. Uh, but do I think – could he make a team doing something different? Yes, I do think so. I think he can play – Freak athlete. He's an ath- athlete. Yeah. If, if he learns how to block, get gained a little bit away, I think he'd be pretty good tight end. You know, he has the hands and stuff like that, and he has some speed. So um, I can see him doing something like that, like how they try to convert uh, Dungey. Yeah. But mm. I feel like he has a little bit more ability, than, a little bit more weight and a little bit you know, bigger than Dungey. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, listen, even just going to speak with him and some of the other players on Tuesday, I thought he was just a really nice guy. Yeah. I thought he made a great leader. I liked all the things that he said. I felt like – whether the team had won or lost the week before, he always kept a good mindset, pretty even keel guy. And yeah, honestly, I think I think that the way I'll remember him is somebody who had a lot of heart. I mean, to hear that that his shoulder was torn and that he was um, enduring all that pain throughout all that time, and the sacrifice he made for his team members, yeah. right? You know, because literally, I mean. He's a quarterback, and if he's trying to play quarterback at the next level, you need to get that fixed immediately yeah. to you know prepare for you know the combine and stuff like that. And he chose not to do that. So it's amazing that really. you know now he's getting getting it done now, not going to beat the bowl game. But that's the sacrifice made for his team, and that's you know you know when, when you say stuff like that, you know I take my hat off to players like that, and you know I feel bad uh, with the criticisms I've given the whole year, <laughs> and feel like a jerk now, like how you how we made you feel. Yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. With the coach, but it all comes back <laughs> it around. It all comes back around. Like you're absolutely right. <laughs> But the kid's tough. You yeah. know, no doubt about it. The kid's tough. And um, he'll get an opportunity. He'll, he'll, he'll definitely go look. I don't know how far he'll go, but, I mean, whoever thought uh, DeVito would be quarterback for the New York Giants. There's that. Exactly. Brendan Hodges. Final show with Brendan. Oh, and, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Cortland, man. Cortland. Cortland. All right, all right. This is. I was going to do that afterwards, but we can do it right now. It's going to be a long show, man. It's going to be a long that's show. What I, that's what I like to see. I like to, I like to see Fran go after the – the, the coach down. You want to you want to get Kurt Fitzpatrick? I and, and and say it and say them. You know you earned this. Yeah. What you did for your team and what you did for the community. It's time for you to. Come up, what if come he, up, come what if Kurt's like? What if Kurt's like? I just want to be a D three legend, bro. Right. I want to be. I can see that too. I can see that as Lance, well. Lance. I mean, like, the 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 ceiling is so high for for Fitz, man. Like, 
I heard they're going to rename Fulton after him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, so Lance Leopold was the guy at Wisconsin Whitewater for years. And he's moved up to the point where he, you know, has, has Kansas in relevancy. Like, it, he's just, he, the dude keeps making moves. Kurt has every reason to do the same. Young coach, Fulton guy, if you're from CNY, like, you know, it, it, blue collar town. And for him to do what he's doing at Cortland in just the four years is amazing. I mean, it's the first state championship in school history. It's the first state championship from a school in what the is this, Northeast United States. We're talking about state champion, man. National championship. Go stand in the corner. This is the high. This this is college. You know how football. much you know how much I've okay. covered in the last month. I, I know what's, know what's going on don't up here. Too excuses. much. Don't want to hear excuses. Okay? Too much. That's a college national championship, Division three. Unbelievable. Hey, back to focusing. <clears throat> is he done on the national championship? Is he done on the state championship? Otto says <laughs> national championship. I messed up. <laughs> national championship. See, that's, knocks that's, off that's the defending. To it. Knocks off the defending <laughs> champs. They're legit, and they made it work, and they got dogs on that team, and I'm excited to see what's next for Kurt. Well, how about, and I forget if they did this when there was 16 teams left or eight. It might have been 16, but there was like a graphic that came out that showed that at one point, Cortland had a 1% chance of winning this thing. Did anybody ever see that? Oh, yeah. I, did, I, did I mean, they were, they were coming in to the playoffs. You know, They were ranked 11th and 13th in the polls. Like they like were they the said, team the that had no business being a part yeah. of it. Do I think Mount Union getting knocked off by Alma was a part of it for sure? But by the way they played, who's to say that they wouldn't beat Mount Union? They were the best team in Division Three, and a team made up of outside of six guys, all players from New York. Yes, that's, we're talking that's, about. There's schools in Texas. Yeah, there's yeah, schools in Florida. Yeah. They got it done. The coaching staffs to thank for that, and these players, man, the, the play, dogs. Yeah, I mean they believe, they believe in the coaches, and that, I mean. Again, that head coach, even though it's Division Three, there are teams that are calling him and asking him, you know, for the next step at Division Two, yeah. or even maybe you know, position coach at Division One. You know, there's coaches out there that are. I mean, there's teams out there calling for him because right, he has the winning the winning recipe. Coach at um that just got named at Cornell. He was Ithaca's head coach, left to be the OC at Penn for two years, and boom, D one head coach. So like. The path is quick, and I'm excited for, for Fitz, man. He's, he's such That's a good. cool dude. Uh, Brendan Hodges, final show, final <sighs> trivia with Brendan. Final trivia and then Woo. final thoughts from your producer, guys. We're going to go back to Kyle McCord, who lost his only start in the game. The most, one of the most heated rivalries in college football, Ohio State-Michigan. He's not alone on that list. A lot of people have lost games. A lot of people have won games. But only one quarterback has won four of them in four years as a starter who is it four bowl games four ohio state michigan games oh undefeated four and oh only one quarterback oh i'm not good with uh okay i can start helping out with this so cj stroud top of the mind i just don't know he doesn't seem uh, like let me ask you a question brandon yeah go ahead what's the the time frame years wise uh, like, I don't think uh, he's like gonna compared to, to now yeah, yeah like, like it, within and, the last 15 years oh okay so like, like maybe this. maybe you should just so wait no I don't think he was there for four years no no I know this one because I, I heard this I saw the stat I saw this so get it, James. no way get it James Michigan hasn't Ohio State has beat Michigan four years straight in a row three I thought no four no Michigan's beat Ohio one has it been four years it's been four years the most okay. are you talking most recently yeah no most recently Michigan's won the last three. So the opposite. So Ohio State. So they won. Four, so what? It, so is, what the it, question is, either side, it, one quarterback has won four games in a row, meaning he was there for four oh. years and he won all four years. Oh, so it doesn't have it's to not, be Ohio it's State. It's not team. Oh. It's player. I can tell you who that is. Yeah, who is it? <laughs> Bob Greasy. No. Uh, <laughs> Bob Greasy. Um, I have to go with Brady. He did say did, last 15 years. I was about years. to say, this man not oh, listen. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't. But I'm Brady, not. did Brady win every time? It's a good question. Um, one that comes to mind, and I don't know if this is out of that time frame or not, Terrell Pryor, I was Western to, PA I was, kid. I was trying to think. I, was trying to, he, I mean, those Ohio State teams with Ted Ginn Jr. were unreal. But four years... Stroud, I don't feel like C.J. Stroud was the guy for four years. 
I feel Fields, like maybe? Justin Fields? I don't think he was four years either. Need a quick answer, guys, because we are running long. Here. Yeah. All right. Everyone think of one. I'll say Terrell Pryor. I, I'm, I'll say Justin Fields because he's on my fantasy team. Okay. I said it. <laughs> what, what, what was it? I did a pootie tang. Who? <laughs> Why don't he's you? Gonna say, you'll go, you he's going to go CJ Stroud. You go CJ Stroud. Yeah, CJ Stroud. All right, Brendan. This quarterback is currently the assistant quarterbacks coach in Detroit. He it's wore number 16 at Ohio State. Mr. JT Barrett went 4 and 0 against no Michigan. No way. He is the only quarterback in that rivalry to go perfect hmm. 4 and 0. Wow. Wow. There we go, man. Yeah. You, you, well, you it wouldn't be ceremonial us. unless exactly. Brendan stumped us in the last now, I trivia. Now, I will say – we didn't do game picks today for because we're running long. Sam crossed and won the picks competition again. Sam, go grab that crown over there I got it. for yourself. And as we do that, I'm going to take the floor here um, because this is my last time with you all here. I have a special guest back here that needs to get back up to the newsroom because uh, they're on a show right now. Um, first of all, just for the fans out there, thank you very much for everything you guys have done for us. We started this podcast, what, Tommy, like just over a year ago? Yeah. Just over a year ago, it's grown so much. We started on our station's YouTube page. Now we're on our own. 500 subscribers. We got that message at 1.30 in the morning on Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, was that Ashley that sent it out? Yeah. Or was it? Thank you, Ashley, for staying up late. Um, and to James and Moten and every one of the guests that we've been able to have on here, uh, it has been an absolute blast. Um, and uh, James, you especially, thank you for butting <laughs> heads with me and um, going from being mad at who this kid is to uh, saying that you learn something new every day. I appreciate being a teacher and winning against you and then Moat and bringing me that back down to earth um, over the winters that we've had together. Okay. Well, I'm, now, glad, I'm glad I'm able to yeah, build up your know, we, we, it was a great, It was a great uh, origin story uh, <laughs> from us. Now to the people that I actually work with every day. Uh, one of them, Ashley Winskowski, not here today. She's off. Um, newest member of the team, but I think we can all agree, super energized, super passionate about this work. Dog. Brings, yes. Dog alert. Brings it. Non-bias. It, I don't know what it is, but just brings it every day, Ashley. We've only had you on here a couple of times because you're always off on Tuesdays, but you have been an absolute pleasure to work with. You filled in for me, actually. Uh, she did a great job. She did. When uh, James and Tommy made fun of the Golden Gopher <laughs> ahead of that bowl game. That was so, great. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley, and keep going viral with your core New York tweets. Those are chef's kiss. Put the, fi put the sign up, Sam. Put the DeVito sign up. I know they lost this week, but put it up. There we go. For the thumbnail. Now to The Apprentice. Desperate for it. The second Sith Lord who is joining me back here backstage. Scoot in here, Rachel. Come here. Can't is, see her. Is there really people backstage with him right Rachel now? Rachel is I back here. Rachel is backstage. She is sitting next to me. Uh, it seems only yesterday I was convincing Rachel here to uh, become evil and uh, mess with you guys when it came to trivia. Join the trivia villain team. Uh, you've been here, what, just a little bit under a year, right? Just over a year. Just over a year. And uh, now she is going to be uh, taking the helm back here, at least as far as I know. And Woo! Welcome, I, Rach. I Welcome. could not be happier Welcome. for her and what she has done um, because she is taking us to new heights on the web and social. Uh, the Culver Byline is a must-read every week. Awesome opinion article. Check it you out. You guys need to read it. Um, enjoy this backseat stage, and please take care of it because it is a very nice spot, and I know you're going to do great. She, hopefully hopefully do. she takes her. Big shoes to fill over here. You'll, you You'll will be able fill to fill them. them. You'll fill them. You'll, like, you will fill them. Big shoes. Like, look at this kid's feet. <laughs> I, I, I wear a size 14s. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing the Tims right now, but she is going to do a fantastic job. And uh, I did hear her, hear, hear her and Sean talking about getting rid of trivia that's not happening. She's no. definitely going to do it. She, she's going to mess with your minds, uh, but may not win as much as I do. I, I think we're going to name this after you. Like the, the trivia should be branded. Like Brandon's this. trivia. Well, yeah, I, mean, that's, that's, I would. I would love that. That's, I the mean, Brandon that's, Memorial that's, trivia. But yes. This is the Apprentice. She is killing now. off the master. She is striking me down because there may only be two Sith Lords, and perhaps a future Apprentice will slay her if she decides to leave. Um, to the captain of the ship, the main host, Mr. Tommy Sladek, not so humble host, fellow <laughs> Eagles <laughs> fan. So uh, has all the connections and deals with me the most. Uh, you said this a couple weeks ago, Tommy, when we announced I was leaving, that I literally stop by your office every day, and it is potentially at the worst time of the day when you're just getting off of one <laughs> show. And then um, 
That would be Brandon. It, it, it would be me. It's <laughs> literally when he's getting ready for the other show, and he could probably care less that I'm stopping down there to just shoot the breeze with him. But he does five-minute conversations, ten-minute conversations. Sometimes I bring a friend because, you know, we're all walking out at the same time. And, um, you know, I appreciate that. I'm going to miss being the, the optimist Eagles fan and talking him and our <laughs> news director, Sean Carroll, off the ledge with every loss, despite the fact that they're 10-4 and four and going to the playoffs and have played the hardest schedule in the league the past six weeks. But, you know, he's just going to have to live with it and learn to uh, be an optimist himself. But, Brandon, uh, I love you coming by every day, man. And, uh, yeah. I well, oh, Captain, my Captain, I bid you fair winds on this new journey without your first producer. And then, last but certainly not least, Her Majesty, the QOD, <laughs> the Queen of Diamonds. <laughs> well, though. That's an inside joke. It Has is. the crown there, too. Uh, it started, Sam, with a proper Facebook message from you. Mm and a much more proper Facebook message that you took offense to from me. <laughs> Transitioning then into a quick double take turn and a wave inside a new house to classroom. And for the past two plus, three plus years has been a friendship that you could only dream to have. Um, you've always said uh, every couple months, I still can't believe we work together. That's crazy, right? That's a direct quote. And most times I answer, yeah, really, who could have seen it coming? And in hindsight, that's a lie because you brought me here. You were the one who reached out to me and said, hey, there's this position open here, and I think you'd be really good at it despite the fact it's not what you necessarily wanted to do. And that leap of faith has led me to where I am now and where I am going in the next couple of days. Um, stuck the landing. It's a perfect 10. I have you to thank for that, and, and now we, we head into the future where we are not best friends. Working together. Mm. <laughs> I was like, Scott. whoa. No, no, we're, we're, no you, you get me. We're, we're, yeah. good. we're still best friends and all that, but we're not <laughs> Such working together. Such a great breath, and we're not. And then <laughs> uh, just for everybody, Speak who from the is, heart. For everybody who is um, out there watching this right now, it has been, like I said, an absolute honor and a pleasure to produce the show for you guys. Um, we see the comments. I got shredded by a couple of fan bases. <laughs> I am totally cool with that. Florida State fans, we love you too because you are the second biggest fan base that we have besides the own uh, Central New York ones. Um, this group of people that you have followed for the course of this last year and a half or so, it's, um, it's not just the Orange Zone team. It's not just a group of friends. This is a family that is one of one. And no matter where any of us go, how far away we go, when we go, how long you listen to us, a year, a month, an episode, I can truly say as one wise person who's sitting in this room always done, the best, best is, is truly yet to come. Yet to come. And I so, was just thinking that. And so for Tommy Sladek, Samantha Croston, Ashley Winskowski, James Munger, Lawrence Moten, Rachel Culver, everyone who's worked on this show for the year plus that it has been alive my name is Brendan Hodges. This has been the Orange Zone Podcast. Have a happy holiday, and this crew will be seeing you next week. Thank you, guys. Love you, Brendan. Thank you, Brandon.